turn to uh, Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. Could you turn me up just a little? I want to be louder than our singers, okay? <laughs> All right, thank you, brother. Second Chronicles, and uh, will you look at chapter 20? If you'll get that in one hand, Second Chronicles 20. And then will you get Isaiah 41 in your other hand? And then with your third hand, you get James chapter 2. James chapter 2, way over in the New Testament. James chapter 2. All right, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, looking at verse 7. Art thou not our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend, forever? Abraham, thy friend. Would you notice uh, in verse in Isaiah 41, verse 8? Isaiah 41, verse 8. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. It's God talking there. And then to James in the New Testament, James chapter 2 and verse 23. James 2, 23. And the scripture, which, the scripture was fulfilled which said Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God, the friend of God. Now what we've been doing for the past few weeks is preaching on some Old Testament Bible characters. We have chosen seven men, men who are righteous, men who are an example that we should learn from them. Uh, we picked uh, Abel and Enoch, and uh, we picked uh, Noah last week, and today we have Abraham, and Lord willing, we will choose Daniel, and then we will also choose David. And uh, these will be seven men that we will deal with. And uh, the book of Hebrews, so you need not turn there, chapter 11, we, some people call it the, the Christian Hall of Fame. You'll find in that great chapter some men of the Old Testament, men and women of the Old Testament, who demonstrated unusual faith. They were faithful to God. And uh, certain characteristics of their faith is, uh, is mentioned. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And Abel shows us that there's only one way to approach God, and that is through the required sacrifice, the worship and approach. Whereas Enoch shows us that we, how to walk by faith after we are saved. Noah was a witness in his day, and he was a worker for God. By faith, he, he, he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness. And uh, all of these men had heard from God. They didn't have a Bible. They didn't have the Bible like you and I have. But God had spoken to them and revealed to them in whatever manner uh, he chose to do so at that time, uh, revealed to them what they should do and what he was going to do. And by faith, they obeyed God. And their faith is recorded in the, not only in the Old Testament, but to the book of Hebrews catalogs that. Now, when we come to Hebrews 11, we read about Abraham's faith. And by faith, Abraham went out uh, into a land which he should after receive an inheritance. He was promised this. He obeyed, went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in tabernacles with, with his children, uh, Isaac and so on. And by faith, you know, the Bible talks about uh, Sarah, talks about her faith. And then it, by faith, Abraham offered uh, Isaac and got, received him up in a, as a figure from the dead and so on. So their faith is talked about. Now, this morning, I want you to think about what I think is one of the greatest compliments a person could ever have would, is for God to call him my friend. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something if Jesus Christ could, could really say of you and introduce you? This is my friend. This is my, wouldn't it be something if God introduced you to one of the angels and said, this is my friend? Is a, well, he, he could say that of Abraham. He said, Abraham, this is my friend Abraham, my friend. And I want to talk to you about that friendship. This, you know, a friend is a valuable ally, a valuable resource. The best thing to do is never make any unnecessary enemies, really. 
You know, some folks are, I, I'm, I'm one of those guys, you know, I'm kind of gifted at making enemies, you know, and that's not a good trait. You ought to make all the friends you can. The, uh, you know, a fellow used to say, don't, don't kick a sleeping dog. I mean, you know, if a dog's asleep, just walk around it. Don't kick it. Why make another enemy, you see? And uh, try to make as many friends as you can. Matter of fact, the Bible, Jesus said that. He said, he talked about a steward, and he said, what you need to do is make friends with unrighteous mammon so that when you're kicked out, you got somebody that'll take you in, see? So, uh, you know, he was saying you need to make all the friends you can. Now, you don't need to compromise the Word of God, but, you know, you might need a little grace to make some friends, you know. And uh, our, our business is winning, you know. And we want to be the sons of thunder, you know. We're kind of like, you know, we want to call fire down from heaven on everybody. And, uh, but that's really not uh, our, our job. Our job is to try to befriend people and to win people to the Lord Jesus Christ in every way we can. And here's another thing. You know, uh, you know, folks talk about, you know, you should always have your shoes shine. And you should. But you ought to shine the heels just as much as you do the toes because you ought to make a good exit as well as a good entrance. And when you leave, you need to leave people with a good impression for Jesus Christ so that if somebody comes behind you, they might be able to get them saved. There's a young man right here this morning that uh, uh, he was downtown Seattle a few years ago, walking the streets, and one of our church members gave him a gospel track. And he read the track and looked at the back of it and came to Open Door, came up here and drove around Sunday morning looking for church, and he found the church and came in and got saved. Say, now listen. Uh, I don't know who gets the glory for that. Don't care who gets it. I'm just glad that somebody impressed him, left an impression to where he would come and look for Christ and, and look how to be saved. And you have no idea. You may, if, if that gentleman, and by the way, the guy that gave him the track is here also this morning. But let's suppose that the man who gave the gospel track had been a member of another church. He gave out the track, never saw the young man again. The young man came here and got saved, goes on to live for God. Do you think the guy that gave the track would ever know it? He'd never know it till he got to heaven. See, you don't know about the influence you leave, so you ought to try to be a good friend, be kind to people, be gracious to people, and try to get people saved, okay? Now, be rough on the religious crowd all you want to. But when you're talking about sinners and people need to get saved, you know, Jesus was a friend of sinners. Did you know that? They're not your enemies. Now, I'm not saying you should join sinners and be like sinners. That's not the point. But, you know, we're not a bunch of monks that go sit on a light pole somewhere or, you know, in a mountain and just hibernate away from people. Nobody here is holier than anybody else. You're all sinners saved by the grace of God. Now, I'm not suggesting you get down in the gutter with people. But I tell you, you're going to have to go to the hog pen if you're going to feed hogs. And you're going to have to go to where sinners are if you're going to get them saved. And you won't get many people saved just sitting in an office or an ivory tower. You're going to have to get your hands dirty. And you're going to have to experience some rejection. If you want to win men, you're going to have to get with men. You're going to have to go where men are. See? And so, Abraham, you know, we need, we need all the friends we can get. You know, a friend, uh, he's someone that you know. At least you believe you know them. That's your feeling. Someone you know, someone you like, someone you trust. That's a friend. He's a person who usually joins you in some kind of a cause. He's an ally. A friend. Uh, you know, the best way, the best place. You know, you usually only go three or four places. You go to church. You go to work. And you may belong to some kind of bowling league or little league or something like that. But bottom line, you know, you know the only other place you go is the grocery store. <laughs> And I just don't like anybody at grocery stores because they always want my money. They're just like churches, you know. You know. In fact, you go to a grocery store, they won't let you out. We will let you out here without you paying, you know. We may talk about you, but we'll let you out. But in a grocery store, they won't even let you out. They got these people setting up down here at Costco. They got lines you can't even get through. And, uh, you know, and then they, they check you there. They call the number of everything. They add it. They take your check. They take your ID. And then they got the nerve to check you again before you get out the door. I just, I hate grocery stores, don't you? Because I get the opinion all they're interested in is money. What do you think? Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you're going to make friends, you make friends. A good place to make friends is at church. Now, some of you, bless your heart, I'm not mad at you, but I need to talk to you. You know why some of you have been here 10 years and don't have any friends yet? I'll tell you why. Because you sneak in here at 5 minutes to 11 and you leave before the church service is over, and you peel out of the parking lot, and then you say, nobody talk to me. You know, really, that's, your, that's, your, that's the way you operate, you know. 
or you're a wallflower, you stand off in the corner, you say, just nobody talks to me. Well, maybe they think you're stuck up. See? You know, really. There's not a church I could attend that I wouldn't get acquainted with somebody. Because I'd make people know I was there. <laughs> wouldn't you? Sure. I mean, just live so that they can't ignore you. You know, be obnoxious, get acquainted. But let me tell you what, you know the best way to make friends in a church like this? The best way is to first of all join it, become a member, and then get involved in a ministry. If you get in the music ministry, you'll become friends with people in the music ministry. If you get in the nursery, <laughs> you get in the nursery, you'll become friends with nursery workers. Matter of fact, you'll be everybody's friend if you get in the nursery. But you understand what I'm saying? You men, if you want to be a friend, get, in, get out here in the parking lot and, meet some, and work with these guys in the parking lot. You want to make a friend? Get in a Sunday school class. Work in there. But the best way in a church is to make a friend is to work with other people on a, on a project. And that's how you make friends. How can two walk together except they be agreed? See? That's how you make friends at work. You know, you're down there. You're with them every day. You've got something in common. That's the same thing at school, PTA, Little League, no matter what it is. You're together. You've got something in common. But you know, if you just rush in and rush out every week, and I'm glad you're here. I'm not picking on you. But don't ever open your mouth and not having any friends, you know. Just, just, just get in it. Amen? So that's one of the ways you make friends is you work together on a common cause and a project together. So if I came to church and found out, and let me tell you what, sad to say, it's not easy to break into an existing church unless you've got a key. It's not easy to break in. It's not easy to break into a group because let me tell you what, in every church, it is families and friendships that holds those groups together. Do you know that? Do you know you will not come to a church to where you don't have any friends or family? You won't stay. You'll leave. No, seldom will anybody come by themselves forever and say, just, well, I don't know anybody. You, you, you'll leave. And when you discover that you cannot break in, then you'll, you'll say, well, they're too unfriendly, you know, and so on. And, uh, but, the, but the danger is this. Once people get together, it is the friendship and the common cause and the family that holds them together. It's that cement that glues them. On the other hand, that cement becomes glue. And it keeps people out of that group. Now, don't despair. That's why a church needs to constantly be starting new ministries for people to be involved in. If you can't do that and won't do that, you know what you'll do? You'll always be in a church of about 40 or 50 people where you've got one group. See? And that's what happens. Now, critics call these little groups cliques. How many of you have ever been in churches where they had cliques? Cliques, you know what I mean. Cliques. How many of you have ever been a member of one of those cliques? Just one guy. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Did you notice what you just discovered? Did you notice you just discovered the other group is a clique? But not yours. <laughs> yours is just a good group of Christians fellowshipping. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Why, sure. Wake up, man. Everybody can't be in your little group. But that doesn't mean the other group is bad. You ought to thank God for it. If your body was just one cell, you'd still be a piece of jelly back there somewhere. See? But the way a body grows, it develops and divides and multiplies cells. And that's the way a church grows and multiplies. It must multiply or die. And then the way you make friends is you get in there and you start working with God's people and, and uh, make yourself available. Uh, friends do that. The Bible calls Abraham a friend of God. And there are certain things that, we, that are characteristic of friends. First of all, you know friends confide in friends. How many of you have gone to one of your best friends and says, Now, you know, I'm not supposed to tell this, but don't tell anybody. None of you, but I, I, haven't you ever seen people like that? You know, and they'll say, Now, don't, don't tell this. You tell your best friend. The only thing is your best friend's got another best friend. <laughs> See? But you know what thing is characteristic of friends is they confide in, in, in another friend. For instance, I read an interesting verse in Genesis 18. Look at Genesis 18. For instance, in verse 16, uh, God is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, he's talking here, and, and it says, The men rose up from thence. That's uh, chapter 18, verse 16. 18, 16, Genesis. 
It says, The men rose up from thence and went towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on their way. These are two angelic beings recorded there, or part of the Trinity perhaps. Verse 17, And the Lord said, watch it, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? In other words, shall I keep secret what I'm going to do since Abraham's nephew's over there? And uh, because Abraham was a friend of God, God told Abraham a secret thing he was going to do. Told him what his plans were. And uh, this, he did this because he considered him his friend. Took him into confidence and said, here's what I'm going to do. And he told him why. Now the Lord Jesus Christ did the same thing with his disciples. Did you know that? For instance, in John 15, verse 15, Jesus said to his own twelve, Henceforth I call you not servants. He said, you twelve, I'm not going to call you servants anymore. Now Paul identified himself many times as Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, which I understand. But Jesus elevated them to a higher level when he said, From henceforth I call you not servants, for a servant knoweth not what his master doeth. See, the thing about a servant is he doesn't know what, have to know what the agenda is. A servant doesn't have to know why you're going to do what you're going to do. A servant simply is supposed to know what he's supposed to do and do it. But you know what you do with a friend? You take a friend in confidence and you say, now here's what we're going to do and here's why and here's how and so on. So here in our text in John 15, 15, henceforth I call you not servants. For a servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. Why, Jesus? For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. I've passed it on to you. Because you're my friends. From now on I'm not going to call you a servant, call you a friend. And that's what friends do. Friends confide in friends. And I guess the question we need to ask ourselves, listen to me, is would God confide in us? Well, the answer is yes. He already has. For instance, he's told us his future plans. I know what the plan for the church is. I know what its destiny is. He's told me in the Bible. I know what the future for Israel is. He's told you in the Bible. I know what the future for the world is. He's already told you. It's in there. And uh, so the Lord, uh, you are uh, considered a friend. Now, since he treats you and me as friends, uh, he treats, matter of fact, he treats us better than friends, doesn't he? We're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, the Bible says. But we ought to strive, I think, to be worthy of that title. You know, uh, friends take or have confidence in friends. Another thing about friends is, is there's trust. Trust. And not only confidence are confiding in them, but there's also trust. Do you know, uh, the question was good, could God depend on Abraham? And uh, could he prove that Abraham was a friend that was worth trusting. And uh, what he did is he promised Abraham that the nations would be blessed through Isaac, his son. He made that promise because he could trust Abraham. I mean, that's quite a, you know, that's, you, you seldom, if you're a businessman, you, you'd be very reluctant to bring a man in and put, put, all the, put the whole plan in his hand. You know, you would really want to do a lot of checking around. And if you just had a small business, it doesn't make any difference. It's important to you. And your livelihood depends on it. So you're very cautious about who you turn it over to. Because all your plans may, are now in the hands of that individual. And what God has done is he's called one man Abraham and he's put all of his plans in that man's hand. The plan for the world. Through thy seed shall all the world be blessed. The nations be blessed. The, the promise of the land was through Abraham. The promise of the Messiah was through Abraham. So really, in, in, in essence, the hope of the world was put there in Abraham. See? And why would God do that? Well, he did it because he trusted him. He could trust him. Now, the thing you do about a friend is you trust them and then you prove them as well. You prove them. So what God did is he entrusted Abraham. He gave him the promises there in Genesis 12. He gave him the land in Genesis 12. Then he gave him a son, Isaac, when he was 100 years old, when Abraham was 100 years old. Then he took that son. Then he told him, he says, now I'm going to test you on my friendship. And he said, now take your son and offer him. And uh, 
He did that to prove him. The Bible says, and it came to pass that God did test Abraham. And the word test there, or tempt, you read in another, in the New Testament, tempt. But the testing there, the tempting is the testing. And he did it to prove him. I talked about this, I think it was in my Sunday school class. No, it was in the prayer meeting this morning. I was talking about, you know, proving people. I had a fellow to work for me, uh, a new man. His name was uh, Larry Delly. Larry Delly's a good guy. He's uh, pastored for a few years up in Bellingham, and he's now over in, uh, right next to Laporte, Indiana there, a little bit northeast of uh, Chicago. And uh, Larry uh, is my friend, and I'm his friend, and, and he'll call me. But he wrote a little booklet, and it's called From uh, Something to Vapor or something like that. But he talks about his experiences, and he came to work for me. And in his book, I never thought about it, but in his book he told, he said, you know, I went to a Pastor Blue, I worked for him, and he called me into my office and said, Larry, I have an assignment for you. And he said, I stood at attention and got my notepad and my ballpoint pen, and I knew he was going to say, there's this grieving family or this funeral you need to go preach. Perhaps this wedding that you need to perform, or, or maybe a hospital visit. And I said, what is it, Pastor? And he said, Pastor Blue said, the ladies' room has a toilet plugged in the third stall. Go down and fix it. <laughs> he didn't need his pen or pad for that. But he said, the thing, you know, that, that I learned is the pastor was putting me to the test to see how I would respond to the assignments. I'll tell you what, if that guy had thrown a fit in the office about that assignment, do you think he'd have been there another month? Of course not. What God does is he tests you on the small things. And if you can't be faithful in little things, do you think God's going to use you in anything any bigger? Well, that's the test. It always is, ladies and gentlemen. It always is. I told you about my daughter getting a credit card. You know, she's about 16 or 17. She had a job, I think, at 17. And uh, so she went in, never had any credit. And uh, so she went to the bank, and they said, well, we'll give you a credit card for $200. And she was griping about that. I said, don't worry about it. I said, you pay that payment on time, keep it paid up, and pretty soon you get something in the mail. Congratulations. <laughs> you know, now you can have $500 credit. And uh, you know what will happen, folks. You keep paying those things, and pretty soon you're a preferred, you know, customer, and you're already pre-approved, and all you got to do is sign the dotted line, and now you can get $20,000 credit at 25% interest or something like that. Right? But if you don't prove yourself, you're going to be in big trouble. Of course, if you do prove yourself and you get that kind of stuff, you'll be in big trouble too, like many of us. But you see about a friend, a friend trusts a friend. The question is, can God trust us? Can God trust you? You know, he's given you the gospel to give to others. When was the last time you passed out a track? When was the last time you witnessed to someone, told them about Jesus Christ? He gave you the plan of salvation. Did it stop with you? Or did you put up a dam and does it just stop there like a reservoir? Or does it flow on? And that's the plan. It should go on and on and on. God didn't plan for the plan of salvation to stop with you and me. Did he? Why, if it had stopped, what if it had stopped with the guy that, that, that just before he got to you? What if it had stopped with the guy before he got to you? See? Or what if it stopped with you? Or what if it stopped with me? What, what if 17 years old, I said, well, bless God, I'm saved. I'm just going to lean back now and enjoy the journey. Why? No one that I'd ever witnessed to would be saved. God's trust entrusted you with something. And there's nothing more valuable than being entrusted with the gospel. Really, I don't know of anything more important than the gospel. You, you just got through saying, I love to tell the story. Or did you just tell a story? Say, you love to tell it? Well, I hope you do. I hope you do, and I hope you never get over it. For instance, he gave you a Bible to read. Do you realize, if you ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you should read it sometime. You can buy it, I think, in our bookstore. Fox's Book of Martyrs talks about the people down through the centuries who died so that you could have this Bible. You know what? We don't have an American flag up here, but if we did, that flag represents all of the millions of people who died that you might be here this morning that you could have freedom. And if I took that flag and laid it on the floor, those of you that know anything about that flag, you'd be insulted. In fact, if you know anything about a flag, it's not even supposed to touch the ground. That's right? Sure. 
But better yet, if I just took that flag and threw it over there and threw it over a chair or threw it down here or stepped on it, you would be irate. That is, those of you that know anything about it. But you know God has given you a Bible that millions have died for. It's the Word of God. And you got it through great struggling others of dying on the cross, people being burned at the stake. You ought to read the story of John Wycliffe others and how you got this book and yet you and I have been given this great trust and the question is can God really trust us with it I know there are folks bless your heart you don't know where your Bible is from Sunday to Sunday you don't even know it's gone until you go to your Sunday school class they say well I can't find my Bible I'll bet you can find your checkbook you can find your TV channeler you can find your magazines but you can't find your Bible? Hmm? You ought to repent. Amen? I mean, God has entrusted you with salvation. You see, you can find that which is important to you. Now, you'd be insulted about a flag. Well, I'll tell you what. I love this book a million times more than I do the flag. I didn't say I didn't love the flag. But, brother, when it comes to a choice between a book and a flag, my choice is already made. My Savior gave me this book. And I love this book. See? And that's why I try to preach it and teach it to folks who come here. That's my job. That's my purpose. That's my life. That's my joy. And the question, you know, friends, entrust us with things. He gave you your Bible. Can he trust you? You know, he gave you your income. He gave you the tithe. You know, the Lord never gives anything directly to the church. He didn't directly give me the Bible. He gave it through somebody. He didn't directly give me the gospel. He gave it through somebody. You didn't, you didn't have God to speak to you and say, Hey, down there! No, he sent somebody to you. And by the way, the same thing is true with the support of the local church. God doesn't rain it from heaven. We don't have the deacons out here with buckets. You know, saying, go out and get the offering. You know what God does? He gives it to God's people, and then he trusts them with it. You know what the average Christian does? He puts it in his pocket and goes buy something with it. Can he trust you? Could he? Think about it. If an employer gave you that responsibility, could he trust you with it? Well, if he could, God should trust you more. Should be able to. Would he be able to say to you, put in your own name, so-and-so is my friend? You know what friends do? Friends sacrifice for friends. You know friends will drive all the way across country. Vacation time comes, and folks will say, well, we're going to be driving to Colorado. We've got some friends there we're going to be seeing. And they'll drive for days to see their friends. They'll get on the telephone, and they'll call long distance and talk to their friends. They're in the hospital. They'll go visit their friends. Christmas time, birthdays come. People buy things for their friends. Those things happen. And uh, so, friends, one thing, one mark of friendship is people sacrifice for their friends. In Genesis chapter 12, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. Abraham was willing to sacrifice his country for his God, his friend. And Abraham was willing to leave his family for God, his friend. And then later on, Abraham separated himself from Lot for God, his friend. And then the Bible says that Abraham built an altar and he stretched forth his hand up over, with a knife up over his son Isaac. You know why he did it? For God, his friend. Friends sacrifice for friends. Now, not everybody who gives you gifts are, are, are friends. But the, but, a, but the mark of a friend is sacrifice. Would you sacrifice in the future to see a hundred people saved and added to the church? Are you and I willing to sacrifice to see ministries added for the glory of God? Would you be willing to give up your favorite position at Open Door Baptist Church to serve in a greater place? 
if the pastor or the assistant pastor asked you to do it? In other words, would you sacrifice? And uh, Abraham did. None of that friends are usually for a lifetime. Usually. Do you know when Abraham was 100 years old, he was still a friend of God? It's sad as people get older, many times they drift away from God. That's, that's a concern that I see. Many folks are fair weather friends. But throughout all difficulty and misunderstandings and loss, Abraham remained a friend to God. He never, like Job, he never charged God foolishly. Friendship is a fragile thing and must be cultivated. Uh, it must not be abused. Friendship will have the best interests of the other person in mind. Uh, some of my best friends are friends that I made while I was in Bible college 30 years ago. John Habman, I've known him for years, he's my friend. Pat Stevens up north is my friend. Al Hughes is my friend. Ken Fraley, Decatur, Illinois is my friend. Jack Cox, LaPorte, Indiana is my friend. Gene Kimmel in Ohio is my friend. Jerry Prevo, Anchorage, Alaska is my friend. Dallas Dobson, Pasco, Washington is my friend. Brother Newell in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho is my friend. You understand? Now, I've got many friends, but I've got, uh, just like you, we've got friends and we have best friends, and then we've got my best friend, don't we? I mean, we're all that way. You can't have a lot of best friends. You ever notice there's always you know, one or two persons in your life that you kind of claim as your best friend? Same. And unless something really tragic has come between you, you know, the, these friendships remain. That's why I tell our young people, college, that's why college is so wonderful. It's one of the best places to make friends. You make friends for a lifetime. Sometimes mates, you know, you meet, meet, a, meet somebody and they're your friend forever. You marry them. You know, not only that, now here's something I need to say. You know another thing about a friend? A friend may wound you for your good. Would you turn to Proverbs 27? I need for you to see this verse. Proverbs 27, verse 6. <clears throat> Look at Proverbs 27 and verse 6. You know what it says? It says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. What's the rest of it? But the kiss of an enemy is deceitful. <laughs> faithful are the wounds of a friend. You know what you have to do sometimes with a friend? You have to risk being rejected for their good. Sometimes you have to say to a friend, no, that's not what you need to do. You shouldn't do that. In fact, if you don't stop that, you're, gonna, you know, you're, going, you're headed for trouble. That's what a friend does. A friend tries to keep you out of trouble. See? And uh, many times, uh, you know, you'll be, you'll be wounded. You wound your friend for their good. You don't destroy them. That's not the object at all. The object is to salvage them. And a uh, friend should tell friends the truth. Now, it may be difficult to remind a friend of something that he or she is doing that's harmful to them. And they may turn on you. You know, they may resent it, and later on, um, you know, I can, all of us, you, you live for a while and you have these experiences, but sometimes you, 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 know, you need to tell somebody what they need to hear. And initially, they may be upset. But you know, my experience is later on, they'll usually contact you or write back and say, you know, at that time, I was offended. But I want you to know, I've had time to think it over, and you were right, and I appreciate what you said. Same. And that's good. It's better if the offense is not there at all. But sometimes that's what we need to do. And some of you folks are very gifted at that. I have, to, you know, I, I have a hard time communicating uh, uh, properly with people. But some of you are good communicators, you know. And, and you, you know, uh, haven't you ever seen folks that could just really beat you up and it was a week before you knew you were beat, that they'd beaten on you? You thought, you know, I really liked that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and they just really uh, gave you a, you know, a work it over. And you didn't even know it was happening until you had time to think about it. And then me, I just open my mouth and somebody's offended, you know. So I just, I have to use some of you folks that have a lot of sympathy. I say, would you please help me with this? And thank God for you, because you balance out folks like Kelly Baxter and myself. 
okay? But, uh, you know, a, fr a friend, you may need to wound, you know. And that's, do you know what, listen, do you know what, if I had my way, I'd want everybody to like me. You know, I'm just like you. I want folks to like me. And sometimes I thought about being a liberal just to get folks to like me. I thought I'd get a, get a skirt, uh, uh, a, a gown, you know, with a turn collar, you know, and uh, just use the NIV and the RSV and the ASV and the Good News for Modern Man and the Torah. Just, just anything, whatever you want. Doesn't make any difference because I don't want to offend you. And if you want to kneel, fine. If you want to sit, fine. If you want to lay down, fine. If you want to stand, fine. Doesn't make any difference. If you want air conditioning, we'll get air over here and heat over here. And, you know, just, 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 you know, just make everybody like you. But I'm not that talented. You know, I've just got one, one sound. It's just like fingers on the blackboard, you know. But I'm like, you really, uh, you know, you, you just, I admire, I mean, I, I almost envy these guys that, like this guy's got this glass church down in California. I mean, he hadn't preached the gospel in a million years. But his parking lot's full, and his building's full, and his offerings are full, and, and he's on television, you know, and, and park drive-in church and everything, you see. I've got one of his books. You know what he said? He said, if you want to build a church congregation, don't teach Bible doctrine. That's what he says. You know, what his, you know what his reasoning is? Doctrine divides. And you know what? He's right. It does. Anytime you say, thus saith the Lord, you lose half of the crowd. And anytime you say there's only one way to heaven, you lose the other half. And then when you say there's only one Bible that's infallible, you lose another half. I don't have any halves you got in this group. You understand what I'm saying? Now, I wish, you know, I'm vain, I'm like everybody else. I wish we had 1,000 or 2,000 people here. I really do. And we could, and we should. But ladies and gentlemen, we cannot compromise the truth for one more person. We will not. We will not. We won't compromise the plan of salvation to get one more member. There's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus Christ and Him alone. And we're not going to compromise that to get you here. Go somewhere else, bless your heart. Go somewhere else. But we're not going to compromise it. We're not going to destroy the teaching of heaven and hell. It's in the Bible. And we're not going to deny to get you here. We're not going to do that. We believe Jesus Christ is coming again. And we're going to teach that if it hair lips everybody in Linwood. We're not going to, we're not going to compromise that so we can get one more body. Now, if we have to wound you to win you, we're going to do it. My, um, I didn't mention it this morning, our good friend Jim Riggins, who's been here many times, sings for us, the Riggins family. Brother Riggins uh, had heart surgery. He didn't have heart surgery. He had uh, triple bypass Thursday. He did not have a heart attack, but he was just... That was the next phase. They said, if you don't do it, you're going to die. But you know, to save his life, they had to cut him open. And to let him live longer, they had to perform surgery. And you know what? A friend who really loves you may have to wound you a little bit. They may have to operate on you. But if you've got any sense, you know that person's telling you the truth. You understand? And men, men who are men, don't like to be lied to. You know, men, men, men want the truth. Even if it, you know, if it slaps them upside the head every once in a while, they say, hit me again, you know. But a friend is somebody who tries to help you and tries to tell you some things if they see the danger up ahead. You know, you know the best way you could help me as a pastor? And I pray that I'd have the grace to listen to you. But one of the best ways you could help me is if you see danger up ahead in the way this church is going or something that I'm doing or not doing. And if you came to me and said, Pastor, <laughs> I may be just a voice in the dark, but I just, I just think I, sh I should tell you this. And then don't get offended no matter how I deal with it, you know, and I pray that I don't, you know, but, but, but you're trying to help me. You understand? You don't help me if you see trouble and just keep your mouth shut. I'm talking about something I'm doing or not doing. 
I'm not preaching properly or handling the Bible properly or administrating properly or loving people properly, you help me if you tell me, if I pay attention to you. But, but your job is to try to help me, and my job is to try to help you. Amen? Why, sure. That's what friends do. God wasn't trying to hurt Abraham when he said, take your boy and offering. He wasn't trying to hurt him because God knew what he was going to do. And God's not trying to hurt you. And when we have our best interest of other people at heart, we're not trying to hurt them. Because then that that's, removes it out of the realm of friendship. And sometimes we have to severely wound people to try to help them. It's sad to say. There was a situation in the Corinthian church where they, had to, they were told to kick this member completely out of the congregation. Put him away. Don't have anything to do with him. And you know what happened? The person repented as a result of it. That's the, that's the goal. But when we don't follow Bible principles like that, we, we head off what God is trying to do. You know what friends do, last of all? Friends have great influence on friends. Would you turn to Proverbs 27, 17? And I will hurry. I know we're just out of time. Would you turn to Proverbs 27, 17? Proverbs 27, look at verse 17. Iron sharpeneth, sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friends. That's influence. Influence. You and I will become like the company we keep. So why not choose friends who will reinforce your beliefs and your character? Choose friends that reinforce what you would like to be. Stay away from, listen carefully. You and I need to stay away from bitter people. When you detect that someone is a bitter individual, if you can't help them, you should avoid them. If you can't help them, you should avoid them. You need to stay away from people who are gossips. You need to stay away from them. You need to stay away from the jealous. You need to stay away from the envious. You need to stay away from the small, from the worldly, from the vain, from the discontent, people that can never be content, they will not help you. Now I'm saying if you can help these people, help them. But when you come to a place you realize that you're not making any headway, then you need to separate yourself from them. Because Why? Because of their influence. There's a man right here this morning, he told me the other day, he said, we were friends with a family that was having marital problems. And he said, we heard them, we'd go out with them, and these, the, the husband and wife would get in a fight every time we went out. And he says, guess what? My wife and I would go home and have a fight. Really, you picked that up. And if you're running around with a discontent, you're somebody in a, you've got a marriage, you've got a couple of folks that are married, and they are discontent in their relationship, you better stay away from them. You know why? Because you'll be discontent in your own first thing you know. Birds of a feather what? That ought to be in the Bible. Because that is a truth, isn't it?